All right, afternoon story, again from Tatterhood and Other Tales, edited by Ethel Johnston Phelps, is Kate Crackernuts. Once upon a time, far to the north of Scotland, there lived a king and a queen. The king had a daughter, Anne, and the noble woman he married had a daughter named Kate. The two girls grew to love each other dearly. However, after a time, the new queen became jealous of Anne, thinking her bonnier than her own daughter, Kate. It was a foolish notion, for the girls were both fine lasses, one fair-haired, one dark-haired. Nonetheless, the foolish queen said to herself, Should a prince come riding by, Anne will surely marry him, and her father would settle the kingdom on the pair, no doubt. This fretted her mind sorely, till at last she went to consult a local henwife, who was known for her magic potions and spells. The henwife took the queen's gold piece and told her she knew a magic spell that would suit her purpose. Send the lassie to me early in the morn, she said, but be sure tis before she's had food or drink. So early the next morning, the queen said to Anne, Go, my dear, to the henwife in the glen, and ask her for fresh eggs. Anne set out, but as she passed through the kitchen, she saw a crust of bread. Being quite hungry, she took it and munched it as she went along. When she reached the cottage, Anne said, The queen has sent me for fresh eggs. Come in, lass, said the henwife. Now lift the lid of that pot and see what you will see. Anne did this, but nothing happened. The henwife said crossly, Go home to the queen and tell her to keep her larder door better locked. Anne took the eggs and went home to the queen to tell her what the henwife had said. The queen knew from this that Anne had had something to eat. So she watched carefully the next morning and sent Anne away fasting. But the princess saw some country folk picking peas by the roadside, and being a friendly lass, she stopped to talk with them. They offered her a handful of fresh peas, and these she took to eat on the way. When she told the henwife she had come for eggs, the henwife said, Lift the lid off that pot and see what you will see. Anne lift, lifted the lid and peered in, but still nothing happened. Then the henwife was rare angry and said, Tell the queen the pot won't boil if the fire is away. Anne went home and told this to the queen. The third day the queen went along with Anne to the henwife to make sure Anne had neither food nor drink. Now this time... When Anne lifted the lid off the pot to peer inside, her bonny head was suddenly turned into a sheep's head. The queen was dismayed. She had not intended for anything so drastic to happen to Anne. How the maids in the castle stared and tittered when they saw Anne. As for Kate, she said she would bide at home no longer. She would go out into the world to seek her fortune and take her sister Anne with her. So she wrapped a fine linen kerchief about her sister's face and head, and off they went with a bannock to eat on the way. A bannock is a round bread made of oatmeal or barley. They walked on and on, over a mountain and down the other side, till at last they came to a castle. Kate knocked at the door and asked a night's lodging for herself and her sick sister. The two sisters were fed and given a room, but they were not long in the castle before Kate saw something was amiss. Such lamenting and grieving among the castle folk. She learned the young prince had a strange illness and no one could discover what ailed him. He lay abed pale and weak, sleeping so heavily all the day that none could rouse him. 
The king was fair beside himself with worry, and he had offered a peck of gold to anyone who could restore the prince to health. But the curious thing, the castle folk told Kate, was that anyone who sat up all night with the prince was never seen again. A peck of gold is a fine fortune, Kate said to Anne. With that, we could seek out a way to break the wicked spell on you. So Kate went to the king and said she would try to discover what ailed the prince. The king shook his head in doubt. It's a strange matter, surely. All manner of herb remedies and word charms have been tried, and doctors brought in. Reluctantly, he gave orders for Kate to be brought to the prince's chamber. When Kate saw the pale young prince sleeping so heavily, she felt a great pity for him. She was a brave girl, and she was determined she would sit up with him through the night to see what she could see. That night the prince slept on, and Kate sat in a chair before the fire. All was quiet in the castle until midnight. Then, suddenly, up rose the sick prince from his bed, dressed himself, and went down the stairs. His eyes were open, but he did not notice Kate. He seemed like one asleep or entranced. Kate followed him quietly. The prince went to the stable where he saddled and mounted his horse. Kate leapt lightly up behind him. Away rode the prince and Kate through the green wood. The moon shone faintly through the trees, and Kate saw the branches on either side of them were heavy with hazelnuts. She plucked the nuts as they passed, filling both her pockets with them. They rode on and on, until at last they came to a green hill, a high grass-covered mound. Here the prince drew rein and called, Open, open green hill, and let the young prince in. And the lady behind him, added Kate. The green hill opened, and the prince dismounted. Kate quickly slid off the horse and hid in the shadows near the entrance. The prince entered a magnificent hall, brilliantly lit as though by thousands of candles. But candles there were none. It was the light given off by all the fairy host gathered there. Fair, shimmering fairy women surrounded the prince and led him off to the dance. The prince danced on and on to the fairy music till he could dance no longer and fell upon the couch. Then the fairy women would fan him for a few minutes and bring him right back into the dance. At last, the cock crowed, and Kate slipped outside the fairy hill. The prince made haste to leave the great hall. The hill closed behind them, and the prince climbed wearily onto his horse. Kate mounted behind him, and home they rode. When the servants came into the prince's chamber in the morning, they found the prince heavily asleep in his bed, and Kate beside the fire, cracking the nuts she had gathered. But not did she say of what had happened the night until she went back to her sister's chamber. Then Kate told her sister of the fairy hill. She had found the cause of the prince's strained sickness, but she knew no way to break the fairy's spell. Anne became very alarmed and begged Kate not to follow the prince through the greenwood again. If the fairies discover you there, they will be angry. They will keep you under the fairy hill for seven years. But Kate said she must go if the prince rode off at night. The second night passed in the same way. The prince arose at midnight and rode off to the fairy hill. Kate astride behind him. Again she gathered nuts from the trees and filled her pockets. This time, after the prince had entered the great hall, Kate crept a little closer to watch and listen. She could hear the fairy women speak to each other, and she saw a small fairy child playing nearby. Again the prince whirled and leaped and danced to the fairy music. 
the bonny prince will not last much longer in the outer world, said one fairy woman as she danced past. Then he will be with us forever. Kate felt despair when she heard this. She turned away from the merry dancers to watch the fairy child, hardly more than a babe, playing with a small polished stick the shape of a shepherd's crook. She heard one fairy woman say, The babe should not be playing with the rowan wand. But the other shrugged and answered, No matter, tis only a charm against sheep's head spells. The fairies danced on. Kate knew she must have that rowan crook, so she rolled some of the nuts from her pocket till the babe dropped the stick and went after the nuts. Kate quickly reached out for the crook and put it into her pocket. At Cop Crow they rode home as before. Kate hurried to her sister's room and touched Anne's head three times with the rowan crook. The dreadful sheep's head disappeared and Anne was her own bonny self once more. But the prince still lay abed, heavily asleep, paler and thinner than ever. Kate said she would sit up with the prince one more night. At midnight on the third night, the prince rose as before. Kate followed him, leapt onto the horse behind him, and together they rode through the greenwood. Once more she plucked the nuts from the branches as they passed and filled her pockets. Once more the prince danced and whirled in the fairy hill, while Kate, hidden close by the entrance, watched and listened to all that was said. This night a fairy child was playing nearby, with a small willow basket, and Kate heard one woman say, "'Tis not wise to let the child have that with the prince here." But the other laughed and said, the prince doesn't know that to eat of that bird would break our spell. Kate rolled out her nuts, one after another, until the basket was dropped, and the child followed the nuts. Kate quickly reached out for the little basket and put it into her pocket. At Cockcrow they returned home to the castle. The prince undressed and fell into bed. Kate undid the latch and opened the basket. She took out the strange bird, plucked the feathers, and cooked the bird over the fire. Soon a savory smell filled the room. The prince awoke and cried out, Oh, I wish I had a bite of that bird. So Kate gave him a bite, and he rose up on one elbow. Kate gave him a second bite, and he sat up on his bed. Then he said, if I had but a third bite of that bird. So Kate gave him a third bite, and he stood up, hale and strong. He dressed himself and sat down by the hearth. When castle folk came in the next morning, they found Kate and the prince cracking nuts together and roasting them over the fire. Great was the feasting and celebration on the young prince's recovery. You may be sure that Kate and Anne, as honored guests, joined in dancing and games right merrily. The folk in the Orkney Islands still tell of it, for the feasting and drinking and the merrymaking went on for seven weeks. And they said that all who were there lived happy, died happy, and never drank out of a dry cup. The end.